truth. Today is the Lord's day. That is why we're here. We're here to worship God. We do so through the songs of praise. We do so through our <coughs> prayers together to observe the Lord's memorial. To have the privilege as we had earlier uh, this morning to give back in that which is already His and to study His Word together. So what a privilege it is for us all to be here. For our visitors, you're our honored guest. Uh, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. Uh, we're very happy to have you and hope you have a safe trip. We would also invite all of you, as, uh, as we always do, to follow along with this lesson with the hard copies, to follow along on the screen, uh, more importantly than anything, to get your Bible out and to follow along in the Bible to prove everything that I say. I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask if you have any comments or if you have any questions at the end of the lesson. That I'll be right back there when this lesson's over with, and I'd be more than happy to discuss anything you, you might want to discuss. Uh, tonight we're going to study the book of Romans. Uh, I wonder how many pulpits say that every morning, or every Sunday, every Sunday evening. Prove me. Uh, not nearly enough. So I'm going to say tonight, please prove me, and make sure that everything I say is as it ought to be. We're going to outline the book of Romans as we do every Sunday evening. We're in chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20. But before we do, let's outline this book going all the way back to the very beginning. In the book of Romans. So if you will, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And let's look at a few things as we go through this outline. Paul wrote this epistle. This is inspiration. Peter would say in 2 Peter 3 and verse 16, speaking of Paul's writing, and he puts them on level, on par with Scripture, and says that they are indeed Scripture. They are inspired of God. It is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Paul was writing this epistle to the saints in Rome, Romans 1 and verse number 7. He isn't writing it to some heathens. He's writing it to the saints, those sanctified in Christ, those that have obeyed the gospel, Romans 1 and verse 5, Romans 16 and verse number 26. Paul then the book in two verses. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God. Can we stop for a moment? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God. Yeah. It is the power of God and the salvation unto all those that believe. The Jew first and also the Greek. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. These two verses mean that God can only save man in one way, that's through the gospel, and the gospel makes man right with God, verse 17. That is how man is made righteous. That is what is meant by the righteousness of God. Yes, we understand that God is righteous, but God's way to make man righteous is through the gospel. And if anyone tells you anything else, they're dead wrong. There's only one way to say it. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 3 and verse 6 would say, to wit the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. There's only one way. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, that contrasts the wickedness of the world, the Gentile world, the ancient world, giving into their own lust and their lasciviousness, as we look at some of those works of the flesh this morning, giving into these things and guiding their own steps, Jeremiah 2, 23. Verse 17 says the righteousness of God. Verse 18 says the wrath of God and unrighteousness of men. Now you look at that content, con that contrast and tell me that wasn't purposeful. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, the Jew is under consideration. Chapter 2 and verse 13 says, For hearers of the law are not just before God, but doers of the law shall be justified. The law of Moses was the standard by which every man that lived under the, that law must, must live by or what? Or else. Galatians 3 and verse 11 is evident that no man shall be justified by the law in the sight of God, but the just shall live by faith. No man was going to do it. No man did it except one. And that's how he could be our propitiation, as we'll look at it just a moment. Romans chapter 3, all are under consideration. What is Paul summed up in Romans 3, 9, and 10? All stand condemned before God. Verse 19 says, For whatsoever the law saith, that saith them under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all may stand guilty before God. Who's guilty before God? Every accountable man. Every accountable man by their own power, whether Jew or Gentile, therefore every man needs the gospel. Amen. That's exactly what is being said. The righteousness of God. Verse 22. It is by faith. There is a difference between faith and works of the law. There is a difference between faith and perfect obedience, earning your own salvation. Isn't that we're going to get that in 
Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace. His redemption that is found in denominational churches. Anybody got a version that says that? I don't. My version says, being justified freely by His grace and the redemption that is found in Christ. Amen. And there's only one way in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Jesus is our propitiation. Verse 25, reference 1 John 4, verse 10. He is our appeasement. God's wrath is appeased. Through his perfect sacrifice, therefore, God can justify the obedient. Verse 26. Isn't verse 26 something that is so often overlooked by the denominational world? You mean to tell me that God is just and he will only justify those who have faith in Christ? That believe in Christ? That's active obedience is what we're speaking about. God will only justify the who? Brother Jerry asked you this morning in the, in the James class, and I hope that you, you... Do you remember that? you remember what he said? Are you all paying attention? He said... Read your Bibles this week, and you bring him any examples of a man that was approved of by God for disobedience or rebellion. Good luck. I don't know how many chapters you read a night. Doesn't matter. You got to read all of them, and then you got to go a little further, don't you? You got to go outside of the Bible to find that because it's not in there. Chapter three, verse twenty-eight. Paul says that we reckon that man is justified by faith and not the deeds of the law. The law is important. So many folks, even in the church, the glorious bride of Jesus Christ, so many individuals, do you know that the church of Christ has the most scholarly and knowledgeable individuals regarding the Bible on this planet? I would put them against anyone. But do you know that even in this glorious brotherhood that we have some that just don't really know what's being spoken of in the world? Some would say, some of the liberal persuasion would say, well, Romans chapter 4 says that it's all, it's all grace and there's no law. Well, no, you don't understand what law has been spoken of. Chapter 328 will lead you to chapter 4, and that's speaking of the law. Now, you go a little further and you look right there, about, right about verse number 30. What's that say? Is God the God of the uncircumcision and the circumcision? What is that? That's regarding the what again, verse 31, the law of Moses? You better keep it in the context, right? Or you're going to miss it. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a snapshot of the book of Romans, isn't it? Chapter 4 shows justification, just as I've never sinned, is not a result of the law of Moses, but of obedient faith. Who's the example? Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. Reference Hebrews 11, verse number 8. Reference Hebrews 11, verse number 17. Abraham was justified by faith without the law, apart from the law. How could Abraham have been under the law if the law wasn't given to some 400 some odd years later. What is Paul proving? Paul is proving that righteousness is of faith, not the works of the law. Which, which works? Works of the law. Did he still work? Sure he did. Read verse 12. We still have to do something. We still have to walk in the steps of that faith of Abraham. Chapter 5. Therefore. What's that mean? Therefore, connects us to something, doesn't it? Where you got to look now? Look back. Chapter 4, verse 25 says that he was risen for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith. Who is justified by faith? The saints in Rome and every person who's obeyed the gospel and is faithful. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we need peace? Paul would say in Colossians chapter 1, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Our sin separated us from God, Isaiah 59. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is dead. We must be saved somehow because we can't save ourselves. That's where Jesus comes in. Chapter 3.25, he is our propitiation. We are saved from the wrath of God, killed against sin, through Christ's blood, contacted by the obedience of faith. A faith that works. Isn't that what we understand faith to be speaking of? Let's go back to Romans 1, 5 and forward to chapter 16 and verse 26. The obedience of faith, the obedience of the faith. We're speaking of a faith that obeys. There is no other faith as far as God's concerned except a dead faith, James 2, 24. Chapter 5 and verse number 11 is through Christ that we receive the, the what? The atonement. Some versions say the reconciliation. It's the same, same concept. We are reconciled to the God of heaven from our own sins through the blood of Christ. 
contact with their obedience to the gospel. Chapter 5, 12 through 21. A contrast. Two men, Jesus and Adam. Adam, one man, death entered the world, or sin entered the world, and death by sin. What kind of, what kind of death? Spiritual death. Spiritual death. Look at verse 12, that last clause. For that all have sinned. The death that we're speaking of is a direct result of sin. Well, babies don't sin, but some babies die. We know we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual death because that is a contrast to verse 21. Spiritual life through Jesus contrasted to spiritual death by our own sin. Chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin living over therein? Know you not that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4. We are immersed, buried with him, and what? Risen with him. What is baptism? Well, the denominational world will say that you can baptize by sprinkling or pouring. Inspiration says it's a burial. It's an immersion. You are immersed in the Christ and you rise to walk in a new life. Reference 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man's in Christ, is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And then I would say to Paul in Acts 22, and verse number 16, And thou art carriest thou, arise and be baptized, to wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. John would say in Revelation 1, verse 5, Who hath washed us, loosed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what happens when you obey the gospel. Chapter 6, and verse 5. In baptism, we are... Three words. Planted together with who? With him. Planted together with. When are you planted together with Jesus? When you believe, find it for me. When you repent, find it for me. When you confess, find it for me. I'll show you where you are planted together, closely united with him in baptism. Oh, you don't need baptism to be saved, then you don't need Jesus to be saved. Who would believe? Colossians 2 and verse 13, we are circumcised without circumcision, made without hands. We are alive from the dead, quickened, that means made alive together with who? Him. Same Him as in Romans 6, 5. Verse 16 says, Know you not that the, to whom you submit yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or what? Obedience unto righteousness. Which one? Where's, where's the third option? The world teaches there's three options. The world's wrong. Two options. Obedience, unrighteousness, or rebellion. That's all you got. Romans 2 8. There is no other option. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, is 18 of the most powerful verses against a Christian being able to live as he pleases. It is absolutely mutually exclusive. A Christian must live godly. A Christian must be holy. 1 Peter 1 16, if he expects to please God. And Romans chapter 6 destroys any notion of the contrary. Verse 17, but thanks be to God, for as you were servants of sin, who's he talking to? Saints in Rome. But thanks be to God, for as you were, past tense, servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. What's the result? And having been made free from sin. You mean to tell me that obedience from the heart to doctrine makes you free from sin? Well, of course it does. Reference Acts 2.38, Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47. Sure it does. Reference 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23. Having purified your souls in obedience to the truth, you would say. Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, 1 through 4. Paul uses a figure. Paul uses a, a portrait. Paul uses a metaphor, whatever you want to call it. To teach that the nation of Israel was amenable to the law of Moses until which time the law was removed. It's compared to a what? Marriage. We talked about that this morning in the works of the flesh a little bit, didn't we? 1 Corinthians 7.39, the wife is bound to her husband as long as the husband what? Lives. When the husband dies, she is free from that law and she can marry another without being an adulteress. That's what Paul says in these first four verses. And, of course, that is, uh, that is simply used to illustrate the fact that the nation of Israel was amenable to the law of Moses until which time that law was taken away. When was it taken away? It was taken away, Colossians 2.14, in the cross of Christ. And when the new covenant was ushered in in Acts chapter 2. A.D. 30, not A.D. 70, as some false teachers claim. A.D. 30. Ephesians chapter 2. You are complete in him. 
before AD 70. Therefore, righteousness, holiness, unblemished, uh, all of these individuals who were faithful stood this way before God through the Christ after the church was established, Acts 2, and even before the events of AD 70. Chapter 7, 14 through 25. These are some of the most misunderstood verses in all of the book of Romans, I think. I've heard someone say that they had such problems with chapter 4. Well, it's the hardest, it's the hardest chapter. Uh, chapter 4 is a breeze compared to chapter 7. But chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, if you understand this in this way, I promise you, you'll have a lot less problems. Now, you notice this, and again, if you have any disputes with anything I say, if you have any questions, please get with me after this. But I think I can explain this to you in such a way as it is clear as a bell. You ready? Chapter 7, 14 through 25. Paul uses the present tense, the first person, to teach and illustrate. Paul is not, let me repeat that. Paul is not saying that he, verse 14, is sold under sin. You know what that means? A slave to sin. Do you think that the Apostle Paul, who just told those in Rome that they were free from sin, chapter 6, 17, and 18, that they were free from sin, but yet somehow he was still a servant to sin? If anyone would affirm that, please let me know when this lesson's over with. Let's discuss it. Because I think you've got a serious problem. I think that you have all the scriptures against you. Is it true that verses 18 through 20, that no good thing dwelt in him when he actually had the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit? And he had already abstained from all these fleshly things? And he was living godly and righteously and not only doing so but teaching others? Do you really think so? Let me tell you what he's teaching here. Paul is teaching by contrast. Chapter 7, 14 through 25 must be understood in light of chapter 8. Now listen to this. Chapter 7, 14 through 25. I'm going to shorten that and just refer to it as chapter 7. Chapter 7 was then. Listen to chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now. Chapter 7, condemnation. Chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. Chapter 7, outside of Christ. Chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. Chapter 7, walking after the flesh. Chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Folks, you have a contrast. Carnally minded, outside of Christ, under the law, chapter 7. Chapter 8, in Christ, now no condemnation. Chapter 8, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the contrast. Now, all of a sudden, those difficult verses become pretty clear. Paul isn't talking about his self or his struggle with sin or the flesh versus the spirit. No, he's not. He's simply telling you that the man who's outside of Christ and under the law, the man that is carnal, there's a big difference between him and the spiritual man. And this is going to continue as we go into chapters 9 through 11. Chapter 8, verse 16, For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How does he do that? Let me tell you how he does it. You want to allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, don't you? Turn to Hebrews 10.15 and notice how God bears with us. Hebrews 10.15 and 16, that's a quote from Jeremiah 31.31. 31. It says the Holy Ghost bears witness. How did he bear witness? Bear witness, he says, through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31.31. 31. The Holy Spirit bears witness through his inspired word, and so does he today. When we do what we have been told to do in the word of God, we know where we stand with God. Isn't that simple? Isn't that powerful? I'd rather have that than any feeling. Well, I want a fuzzy feeling. I don't. I want truth. I want objective truth. Chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Sum it up in one word. Hope. Chapter 9. Paul is sorrowful. Why? He is sorrowful for who? His kinsmen according to the flesh. The nation of Israel. The physical nation. He is sorrowful for them because they're not benefiting from chapter 8. But they're where? Chapter 7. Carnal. Outside of Christ. Under the law. Condemnation. He wants them to be what? We'll see in just a minute. Say it. Now you look at verses 4 through 6. He begins to illustrate that just because you were of the nation of Israel didn't mean you were of the seed, spiritually, of Abraham. Speaking of that seed, reference Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and tell me how you're the seed of Abraham. And then read verse 29. You're a seed of Abraham and a child of God by obedient faith, by being baptized in Jesus. That's how you are. Chapter 9, he uses two prophets. To illustrate that God will do away with that covenant and institute a new covenant with another people who are not just of this nation physically, 
Hosea and Isaiah, verses 25 and 27, chapter 10, verse 1. His heart's desire for Israel was that they be what? Saved. Well, that reinforces our view that chapter 9, he saw, well, because they're stuck in chapter 7 and they're not in chapter 8, are they? They're not spiritually minded. They haven't obeyed the gospel. They have a zeal for God, don't they? Ignorant zeal. Not according to knowledge. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. They're continuing to keep a law that they're not even amenable to anymore. The nation of Israel was free from the law by the body of Christ, Romans 7 4. When Jesus died and instituted the new covenant, and those Jews, the first fruits, Romans 11, obeyed the gospel, there was no Jew walking the planet that was amenable to the law of Moses any longer. So why were they continuing to try to keep it? Remember that? Ignorance. They were zealous ignorant. The righteousness of God in the book of Romans, that phrase, verses uh, 2 and 3, is what? What's it mean? Gospel of Christ. That's what it means in the book of Romans. The righteousness of God is made available by the gospel. Romans 1.16, Romans 3.22. It's the word of faith. The same gospel they preach, verse 8. Verse 19, who does he introduce now as being another prophet to bear witness against him? Moses. Chapter 11, did God cast away all of Israel? How could he if Paul was part of that remnant? Verse 5, the remnant, the, the remnant according to the election of grace. That is the obedient. Those that obey the gospel, and Paul's part of that. What did Paul do? Acts 22, 16. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. The elect means chosen. And you're chosen by the gospel. You're chosen by obedience to the gospel. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. Chapter 11, verse number 14. The preaching of the gospel to the Jews, uh, to the Gentiles, was meant to not only save them, but to provoke the Jews a little bit. It calls them to obey. Verse 33, God's mind regarding redemption for man is truly a magnificent thought that man is not fully capable of understanding. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove it. You may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Three times in the New Testament, folks. Romans 12, 2. Ephesians 5.10, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove it, prove it, prove it. If you can't prove it, what? <coughs> Don't do it. We are members one of another. Chapter 12 deals with our interaction and how we should treat each other. We're members one of another, verse 5. <coughs> verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. That means hypocrisy. To abhor that which is evil. Cleave unto that which is good. We are to hate sin, and we are to hate the sin that our brethren engage in. We're to hate it to such a degree as that we go to them and we try to help them. That doesn't mean help them sin. That means correct them if needed. Ephesians 5 and verse 11. James 5, 19 and 20. Chapter 13. Chapter 13 deals specifically with governments. The Christian is to submit to the government as long as the law of the land does not conflict with the law of God. If it does, Acts 5, 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. We ought to pay taxes. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love is the fulfillment or fulfilling of the law. That takes us to chapter 14. <coughs> chapter 14 deals with what? Oh, how this chapter is abused by folks today. Why? Look at the first five verses and you can see what's being spoken of. Customs, not doctrine. You have two mentioned specifically. Keep in mind, this was written to first century Christians, mainly Gentiles, chapter 11, verse 13. Regarding what? Regarding the Jew and Gentile being in one body and trying to alleviate the enmity between the two. And if the Jews who are used to keeping the law of the Moses and the customs regarding meats, verse 1, and days, verses 4 and 5. So if an individual said that he was not going to eat pork because he couldn't know the law of Moses, the Gentile, if he was going to cause any harm, should abstain from eating that pork in front of him. He should forego a matter of option to make sure that he didn't harm his brother. The same thing regarding days. Now for anybody to take this chapter and think that it means you can do whatever you want to, you've missed it and you're going to, it's going to cost you. Matters of option, not doctrine. There is no liberty in matters of doctrine, period. Chapter 15. Verse number 4. For what sort of things were written before time were written for our learning. Verse 5 speaks of the God of consolation and hope. Isn't it interesting that 
through study and reading of the Old Testament, we understand that He is a God of hope because He always follows through on His promises. Chapter 15 and verse 18, For I dare not speak of anything, save those which Christ wrought through me for the obedience of the Gentiles and word in thee. Now I want you to notice something. Verse 18 in chapter 15 says that he would only speak the things revealed to him by Jesus. Look at verse 19. In speaking only that inspired word, he fully preached the gospel. What's man's excuse today? Well, this is outdated, so I need to be a little more relevant. I'm going to speak on matters. We're just going to make you feel good when you come out. Then go ahead and take that name off the sign. Put Jeroboam's church up there. Don't put Jesus' church up there. Because you're not representing Jesus unless you do so accurately. And that's by speaking by his oracles. Speaking his gospel. And when you do, you have fully preached the gospel. There's no need for any of this man-made stuff. Let's go and outline this chapter real fast. Then we'll get into the verse. In the closing chapter of the great book, Paul sends salutation to various saints in Rome. Verse 1, Phoebe was commended. She was a sister. She was not a deaconess. There is no such thing as a deaconess. She was worthy of their support. Verse 2. He sent salutation to Priscilla and Aquila, who labored with and risked themselves for him. Verses 3 and 4. The church that assembled in their house was to be saluted as well. Verse 5. Various Christians were greeted. Verses 6 through 15. The churches of Christ, that is the various congregations of the one church, saluted them in Rome. That is not a reference to various denominations. That is various congregations of one church that sent their salutation. Verses 17 and 18, the false teachers that served themselves rather than God were to be marked and avoided. Verse 19, for your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Who is obedient? Who is he right to? By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom also are ye called of Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Who is obedient? The saints in Rome. Those that were no longer serving sin, chapter 6 and verse 16, but were obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine, chapter 6, 17 and 18. That's who he's talking to. Those that have been baptized into Christ, the old man was dead, chapter 6, and that new man was living for him. Why and how was this known to Paul? The congregation must have been around long enough and been working enough for this news to get to Paul. It had come abroad to all. That word all is the same word used in Galatians 6 and verse 10. We are to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Not only was this known to Paul, but they were reputed by all to be faithful and working. He says, I'm glad on your behalf. In 3 John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3, you have a similar sentiment written by John concerning why Paul is happy for this reason. Why he's happy regarding this. Notice, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John is speaking spiritually that they were his children. They weren't necessarily his offspring. But we are speaking of individuals who had taught and labored with them. And it's always so good to see. Uh, well, we can all understand that. Anyone that we see, uh, the good visitors, when, when they, go to, uh, uh, they go to journey and, and vacation and the same is true with us when we go and we meet and assemble with other congregations. It's always nice to have a, a nice, sound, faithful, loving congregation. It's, it's often actually disappointing when we find those unsound. I mean, I found them, unfortunately. Isn't it wonderful to know that the brethren walk in truth? And that's why Paul was glad on their behalf. Paul, would that they be wise unto that which is good? Wise means skilled or an expert. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, same word, and hast revealed them unto babes. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. Paul desired for them to be learned and knowledgeable unto that which is good. But what's good? Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse number 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but, foolish, uh, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable. Notice what is good. What is the standard for good? Well, I think this is good. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what God's Word says. God's Word equips us for how many good works? Let's read it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto a few good works. Can you guys read that? Unto all <coughs> good works. So guess what? If something is good, it's in here. Religiously speaking, if you want to do a good work, why don't you do what the New Testament tells you to do? That's pretty simple. He wanted them to be simple regarding evil or concerning evil. Simple sometimes, and simple sometimes does mean uh, that you're not mentally capable of understanding. That's not what's being spoken of here. It isn't ignorant, but innocent is what is spoken of. Notice this same word used in some other text in Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless. That's the word, as doves. Philippians 2, 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So that's what we're speaking about. Regarding evil, they are to be harmless and innocent of it. They are to be harmless concerning evil, giving no offense, void of any wickedness. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. James says in James 1.21, Therefore, lay apart some. Therefore, lay apart. That, that's pretty big writing. He said, you could probably all read that. Therefore, lay apart some filthiness. No, no. All of it. Wasn't that emphasized in the last couple of weeks in the James class? Every bit of it. you got to lay it aside. All of it. Lay apart all of that filthiness. And overflowing. Superfluity of naughtiness. Lay it all aside. Concerning evil. Those who know good are also wise about evil. A bad thing happened in the Garden of Eden. A bad thing happened because man became knowledgeable of evil in a bad way. Man became knowledgeable, knowledgeable of evil because man brought a reproach upon himself. He sinned against God and instead of doing it, he was, he was what? He, he recognized his condition. He was, he was scared. He was anxious. He was ashamed. For us, if we know good, if we study this morning some works of the flesh, that makes us knowledgeable about some things that are what? Evil. That doesn't mean we engage in them, does it? As a matter of fact, that will help us, that will help equip us so that we don't engage in them. And we can identify them and help others as well. But strong meat belongeth unto them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It doesn't mean you indulge yourself, it means you know about it. And that's what he wanted for these brethren. Verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Satan would be bruised under whose feet? I think it's a mistake if every time you read the New Testament, you read it, and every time it says a personal pronoun, uh, that is, speaking of you, to the saints in Corinth or the saints in Rome or the saints in Ephesus, I think that if you don't understand the context in which it's written, you're going to make a mistake or two. If you think that every verse was written specifically to you, then you're going to have some misunderstandings. Now, that doesn't mean that these verses don't apply to you, but folks, they weren't written to you. They were written to specific folks. They were recorded for us. I'll give you an example. Have any of you offered your firstborn son? Well, of course not. That wasn't speaking to me, was it? That was Abraham. Anybody build their ark today? Oh, no, that was Noah. Okay, so we understand that we do have to rightly divide some things. So it says that Satan would be bruised under whose feet? Your feet? Well, that's not what the text says. Satan would be bruised under their feet. What does shortly mean? Things must shortly come to pass. Revelation chapter 1. It says it again in, in the last chapter. Chapter 22. Shortly come to pass. We're speaking of things that would happen shortly to the saints in Rome. I don't believe this is a reference to the end of the world. 
but something that would happen as long as they were faithful to God. And it references all the way back to a verse. Chapter 3, verse 15 of the book of Genesis. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Their faithfulness, their faithfulness among the false teachers of verses 17 and 18 would do something. What would it do? It would overcome the world. In 1 John 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Record 1 John 2, 3 through 5, to understand what faith means. Overcoming the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. You, through faithfulness, overcome the world. You overcome sin. You overcome the wicked one. Their faithfulness would overcome the device of teachers that were spoken of in the previous verses. 17 and 18. Don't remove this from the context. 17 and 18. Those device of teachers that needed to be marked and avoided, their faithfulness would overcome their influence. As Kaufman would say in his commentary, the bruising of Satan is not something you promise for the remote future, but it is a triumph over him to be won immediately and speedily by the Roman Christians who would have had the effectual aid of God in maintaining the unity and peace of the Christians when they would be attacked by the false teachers, the entire thrust of this whole passage is not forward to the eternal judgment, but retrospective to Genesis 3 and verse 15. I think Mr. Coffin is right on the money. The grace of Jesus be with you all. All blessings afforded to the uh, faithful and by their continual obedience to the words of Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness in all time, Psalm 106 and verse 3. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with their whole heart, Psalm 119 and verse 2. But he said, yea, rather, blessed are they which hear the word of God, and keep it, Luke 11 and verse 28. What a wonderful study. We're almost done with the book of Romans, book of Hebrews coming up. Can't wait. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel of Christ? If you're of a Catholic lady and you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you're in terrible danger. Don't you understand that the only way that you can be saved from your own sins is by His gospel? Romans 1, 16 and 17. What does it mean to obey the gospel? First, you must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 8, it is the word of faith. It is the means by which faith is produced, verse 17. When you read and you understand this word, you ought to be convicted of the truth of it. That should bring about a change. Matthew 5, 3, you should recognize your condition, your poor spiritual condition before God. You should want to change. You should repent of your sins. That is a change in mind that leads to changed actions. Folks, you can't repent of sin and continue in sin. If you do, you haven't really changed your mind. A changed mind brings about an amended life. Always. Acts 26, 20. Acts 17, 30 commands all men everywhere to repent. That means you and thou. Confess Christ before men. Romans 10, 10. It's unto salvation. But even unto this point, you've not been forgiven. You've not been added to the church. You've not been made a child of God by faith. That comes through the baptism into Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 27. Colossians 2, 13. Acts 22, 16. Revelation 1, 5. Won't you obey the gospel if you have? Be faithful even unto the end. And we know where we stand with God. We have hope. For those who have obeyed the gospel, have you not been faithful? Are any of you living in constant and repentant sin? Will you not acknowledge that? Will you not acknowledge that to God? Pray that he will forgive you, Acts 8, 22 and 23, and know assuredly that he will. Won't you continue then at that point to walk in the light, knowing that you have access to that soul cleansing blood? If you need the prayers of the church, we'll pray with you for you. 1 John 5, 16, we know assuredly that if we pray one for another, for those who repent, that they'll be forgiven. Consider your condition tonight as we sing this invitation song. And if you need to be baptized into Christ, come forward. If you need the prayers of the church, we'll pray with you. You're invited to come forward to the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand. Oh, do not let.